Hi everyone, welcome to the first lecture video for SI335 and today we're going to look at a few algorithms for this sorted array search problem that we introduced last class. The first algorithm that we want to look at is linear search. It's kind of the simplest thing that you could think of to do um, where it's going to go through the array and then stop when you find the element or when you go past it. So I want to emphasize that it's still taking advantage of the fact that um, the array is sorted. So stop uh, when we go past the element that we're looking for. So it's not always going to scan through the entire array, but it'll go up to the point at which you find it or when you find something that's greater, because as soon as you find an element which is greater than what you're searching for, um, that means that you must it must not be in the array. And uh, this syntax that we see here, this is Python. Um, so the if you're not a Python expert, that's OK. I'm just using Python as a precise way to describe algorithms. Uh, we could also use pseudocode, which actually ends up looking kind of similar to Python. But sometimes in the details, pseudocode can be a little bit vague. Uh, so that's why I like to use Python here. And, and all these examples are also available on the notes page. You can download and run this yourself if you want. Uh, so the main thing to know for Python is that uh, len of a means the length, and um, that indexing is from 0, like how we expect. So that's the linear search algorithm. Um, the second algorithm is binary search, which I know that you've seen before. The idea with binary search is to split in half. So idea is to uh, we maintain these left and right indices. So at any point in time, we have no idea where the thing is, where it is within the array. So we store some left index of this first place that it could possibly be and a right index of the last place where it could possibly be. And then we check in the middle. And we say, hey, is this bigger, smaller, or equal to the thing that we're looking for? And that allows us to either, if the thing right here is smaller than what we're looking for, then that allows us to move the left index up to here. So now we're only looking at the right half of the array. And if whatever's here is bigger than what we're looking for, then we can move the right index over to here. And now we're only looking at the left half of the array. So at every step through, we get to kind of cut down on the space we're searching by a half. And at the end, what, what controls this loop is as long as left is less than right. So once the left index goes past the right index or is equal to it, that means that there's only one more thing left to consider, and that must be the thing that we are searching for. So that's why there's this extra if statement at the end that, hey, if that thing, if, if the thing we're looking for is anywhere in the array, it must be at this index now. So if so, we return it. Otherwise, we say not found. It must not be there at all. And the third algorithm here is something which is probably new to you, or um, you might not have seen it. People call this different things. Sometimes this is called a one-sided binary search. Um, the idea is to start, is you have an initial phase, which is called like the galloping phase. So that's like kind of these three lines. And then after that, you do a binary search. So you start by galloping, and then you just end up doing a binary search at the end. And we'll see why um, this brings some specific benefits in some cases. But you might take a second now to think about what's the what's the benefit here. Um, we can draw, we can diagram out sort of what this looks like. If I have a big array and I'm searching for something, the first phase of this. So let's say that my target is right here, but but of course I don't know that. You start with i equals 1. So the, the places that you search for galloping are going to be increasing like powers of 2. So we're first going to look at this index, and we'll say, OK, my target is past that. So then I'll skip and go out. The second one will be index 2. So actually, there I don't skip much. I look at the second index. And now I skip to index 4. And then you skip to index 8. And then you skip all the way out to like index 16, so maybe something looking roughly like this. And at this point, 
now we have um, gone past what we were searching for. And so the last phase of the Gallup search is to then do a binary search in that range that's left over. Why is this beneficial is that um, it's starting from one side and kind of repeatedly doubling until we, the first time that we either reach the end of the array or we go past our target. The key is the key idea intuitively, and we'll see how this plays out in practice, is that if we're looking for something which is close to the beginning, then we don't have to spend time doing a binary search or some other like linear scan through the whole array. We just get to focus our attention on the beginning more. Um, so at the end, you just do a binary search, and that might be what happens if your target is near the end of the array. You have to do a binary search on kind of half of the whole array. But if it's closer to the beginning, then you don't have to do many Gallup steps, and you, and you can potentially find that target more quickly or find that it's not there too quick, uh, more quickly if the thing that you're looking for is near the beginning of the range of the array that you have. So that's the three algorithms we have, linear search, binary search, Gallup search. Um, the next part of the notes, and I also have something in these slides, is something called loop invariance. Loop invariance is a really useful tool in order to prove formally that a loop algorithm, and you can notice that I expressed all three of these algorithms in terms of loops, um, to prove that that always gives the correct answer. Um, and it's a way of kind of reasoning about code to prove that we haven't missed any edge cases. Um, and I think especially with these search algorithms, it's easy to have a small mistake that if it's at just this right index, then maybe you needed to do left plus one or left minus one. And so this is a useful way of formalizing um, how to prove that that's correct. But uh, in my experience from trying to teach this in the past, uh, it's also a really tough thing to grasp and involves proofs. So we might come back and revisit this later when we really have some complicated algorithms where we have no idea whether they're correct or not. Um, so I encourage you to look at this part in the notes if you're interested to learn more about loop invariance. It's a very useful tool to formally reason about algorithms, but it's something that I'm not going to focus on this year or in this version of the class because I want us to get to kind of these design strategies a little bit more quickly. So I'm going to skip past this and we're going to think about um, some analysis. So before I show you some experimental results, I want to emphasize, and we kind of talked about this in class, that we have a lot of different options that are going to affect the implementation results. What programming language, what machine do you run it on, which compiler do you use, which, how do you actually use the tools in that programming language. Um, and so it's really hard. I'm going to show you some experimental comparisons between these. Uh, but at least when we're making a comparison of algorithms, we can try to keep these the same um, to do like an apples to apples comparison. Try to do an apples to apples comparison. So for the three versions that we're going to look at, all three versions were done by me in C++. Um, and I used similar C++ features, and I used the same like GCC compiler and my laptop to run them. Um, so there's still all these inherent problems with doing an implementation to do a comparison, but this is a re reasonable way if you have the same programmer with the same effort level and the same skill level, the same equipment doing all three. So here's an initial set of results. I have some different arrays that we experimented on and some different x values that I'm searching for, um, and then some different results. Sometimes it's in the array, sometimes it's not. And here's the timings. I think these are milliseconds, um, maybe nanoseconds. Anyway, it doesn't really matter because we're, we're just trying to do a relative comparison. Uh, and what we see is different algorithms end up being better for different examples. So if we go through this, we can see that like for this very small input of six, seven, and eight, uh, linear and binary search both 
took the least amount of time, faster than Gallup search. For this array with uh, a, you know around 100 things in it, and we're looking for something near the beginning, um, linear search end up being a little bit faster than either of the other two algorithms. In this case, where we have an array with a few hundred things in it, and we're looking for something right in the middle, binary search is the clear winner. This example has a few thousand things in it, but we're looking for something very close to the beginning, and linear search ends up doing best. Notice that Gallup search is kind of second best there. Uh, and this one has more like 10 or 100,000 things in it, and um, we're looking for something that's not exactly right at the beginning, but closer to the beginning than not. And in this case, Gallup search ends up being the fastest. And for this last example, where we're looking for something near the end, um, binary search is the clear winner. So what I want to emphasize is that without any other organization, if you're just, so if somebody's asking you what's the fastest algorithm, this is kind of a nonsense question. Uh, I don't know how to answer this question. Um, because depending on the input, sometimes one algorithm is faster, sometimes another one is faster. And that's where we have to start to use some tools of analysis and simplification to make some decisions um, in order to extract some real information to be able to make some comparisons here. We could stare at this more like um, there's a couple of interesting things that I think you should notice from these timings. One is this one. So linear search seems to really do much worse when it fails in some cases. It does much worse than the other two. Um, Gallup search is least frequently the best, so that might cause us to discard it. But notice that I think in all the cases where it's not the fastest, it's always, or not always, but usually the second fastest. Um, so that's kind of interesting. It, it, it's worse, but not that much worse than some other approaches. Um, so, all right, let's think about what this means. The first simplification that we make in analyzing an algorithm, this should be something that you already kind of know intuitively from your experience in IC312, but we have to emphasize it that we have to organize these things in some way. These are just like totally disorganized, just some random running times. We need a way of sorting things. Um, so we need to sort the timing data uh, so that we can think about, especially when we're thinking about analyzing algorithms, we think about how they grow in terms of the input size. So this is what's called a difficulty measure. Usually we just think about the input size, but we could think of sometimes there's other difficulty measures. You know, if you, um, especially if you think about more complicated kind of optimization problems or graph problems or um, like AI type problems, the size of the input sometimes doesn't matter as much as the level of complication in that input. And so sometimes you use a different difficulty measure. The most common one we'll use though is input size. What that allows us to do is take that kind of random scattering of timings that we saw before, and now we can start to put things in a plot. So what we've done is organize everything in terms of the input size here. So there's three colors, and there are also three different shapes, in case you have difficulty with colors. And they are now showing us what are the different running times for these three algorithms on all the varying inputs that I've tested it on. Uh, organized by input size. So we see some clear picture here, but it's also still scattered, like the time for linear search. You probably notice right away that we have this kind of straight line growing thing up top, but you should also notice that linear search is this red cross that's at the bottom. It's usually the fastest and the slowest running time for any given input size. So that tells us something about the algorithm, but what it tells us is, is not immediately obvious. Um, and then you see that there's also kind of a cone for the Gallup search that's kind of going in this range, uh, has that kind of a spread. And then I want you to notice that the binary search has the tightest spread in the running times out of any of these. It's always in this kind of tight little range. And so what does that tell us about the relative quality of all these algorithms. You know, linear search might be the best or it might be wildly the worst one. And 
how can we make a determination of what algorithm might be best for some given circumstance? Well, the first thing we want to do is kind of simplifying from this range, this this blended range, you know, we could say we could kind of fill this in and say this whole red area is the running time of linear search. But now that covers all the other algorithms. It doesn't give us anything useful to work with. So what can we do first is we we make this into a single function. If you I'm, I'm using mathematical terminology now, uh, so I mean function in terms of mathematics. If you think back to your discrete math class, fond memories, I know. What makes a function a function mathematically is that for every input, in this case input size, there needs to be exactly one value. So you can't have the one rule with a function is that you can't have two outputs for one input. So what we want to say is for every input size, we want one answer. Um, we want a single running time. And there's three general ways to do this, and, and maybe some more, but three that are seen most commonly. Um, worst case running time is what you know are most familiar with. That's choosing the largest running time for each size. Best case means choosing the smallest, and average case means taking the average of all of them. Um, so worst case is usually most significant. That would mean taking the top out of all the ranges of running times, we just focus on the top one. Um, top one for Gallup search, top one for linear search, top one for binary search. We could also think about best case time, um, and we can think about average case time. And they all have different benefits of thinking about them. Worst case is kind of a pessimistic view on the world, is saying, well, I know for sure, wh like why is worst case valuable? Is you can say, here's the worst case running time. I know for sure that when I run this on any input, it's not going to be worse than that. Um, so it's kind of a pessimistic or conservative way of analyzing an algorithm. Um, and so that's why sometimes we think about these other cases as well. But let's start with worst case. And here's the worst case now. So what I've done is just drawn a line here, um, you know, more precisely than my little pen, to show here's these lines. So these are what we're actually going to compare between the three of these. And now between these three lines, I think your intuition about some things about uh, growth rate should start to come into play. Um, you can start to see it's not just a spread of crosses on a screen. It's We start to see that this red line looks kind of like a line. Uh, it seems to be growing. Um, there's a reason why it's called linear search. And these other blue and green lines, well, you kind of already know that binary search is big O of log n. And what you, I think, kind of comes out in this data that we can see is that the blue line seems to be kind of parallel to it. So growing at the same rate, but just a little bit like a constant factor larger. And so that brings us into analysis, which is now we've kind of defined the problem of we have multiple functions, single functions, so single output in terms of a single input size. And now we want to compare these. Um, we have these different growth rates. And how do we understand that? And these are all the reasons why um, this is why we use big O analysis in general. The other word for this is asymptotic analysis. And what does asymptotic mean in this case is that we're really thinking about what happens as the time um, grows. And that's what we want to focus on. And again, to save ourselves, the, uh, th these are some reasons like we talked about before of why we actually want to do analysis instead of just trying to implement everything. Um, and so we have to make a few simplifications in order to do this analysis. And that's what we'll start to talk about next time. So before we see that and we, and we go into what are the simplifications, I think that you know already um, what is the big O of all three of these going to be. So this linear search is definitely big O of n. Um, and the other two, Gallup search and binary search, are both big O of log n. Um, but even though these have the same big O, there's still some differences between them. Um, and even though linear search is big O of n, which is worse than big O of log n, it's still better 
than some other approaches in some circumstances. Um, and for example, it has, if we looked at the best case analysis, we would see exactly an inversion of these three behaviors. And so that's what we'll think about a little bit more and talk about um, next class and next week. Thanks for your time. Don't forget to, I, I'm not gonna say like and subscribe. I'm gonna say, don't forget to uh, put in a question and answer on the Q&A forum. And thanks for your flexibility. I look forward to working through this with you next time we meet.